wasn't he related to uh, Dominic through marriage? I don't think so. Uh, sure. Yes. He got married to the John. Mm-hmm. What we're doing is the oral. You can just stand wherever you are. It picks up. Okay. We're uh, doing the oral history project as part of the 50th anniversary. And this is February 27th, in 1995. And I'd like the people to introduce themselves. And it's uh, part of the pad making department. Okay, so if you would give us your name and your title here. Yes, my name is Christine Pupillo. P U P I L L O. And I'm an adjunct assistant professor. I was a full time professor, but uh, two years now I've retired and I'm still working here. I am Professor Leonard Tratner, the chairman of the pattern making department, and it's spelled T-R-A-T-T-N-E-R, and I've been here since 1964 when I started here as a student. My name is Harry Greenberg. My title is Adjunct Associate Professor. I was hired by Mortimer Ritter in 1947. That was at the High School of Fashion Industries. He said then that you look like material for FIT. As soon as it opens up, you'll be the first to be notified. And so I swung into FIT. At the time, they had an office on the eighth floor with a, took me up there with a file. And there was about three people working there. And they went a long way in this 50 years. <laughs> I just mentioned the interviewer, I'm Carol Cole, and the filmmaker is Mark Gaynor. And could, could I follow up on what you said? You were working at the Fashion Industries High School? No, I, uh, I, That's how we I all was started. working at the fashion, oh. High School of Fashion Industries for about two years, or three, whatever, until FIT came into okay. being. And then I, he swung me right into FIT. But when I say hired, it said, I was with him for two hours, and he said to me, you're in, as far as I'm concerned. But I didn't know that after that I had to take a two-day practical exam. I took a pattern-making exam for two days. They gave me a one-way piece of plant to lay out the goods, and they tried to fool me with that. After I made the pattern, I cut the sample. I wanted to make, up the sa I wanted to make it up, and they told me, no, no. <laughs> You can't do that. We we don't want you to doctor it up. And they gave us they gave it to a sample maker, and uh, uh, it wasn't easy in those days to get in to teach at FIT. When you say who is Ritter, what title did uh, uh, Mortimer Ritter was the first president of FIT? IT of yes. FIT. He's the one that actually got it started. And who did he work with? Who selected him as the president? Who selected him? I the honestly don't know the history of that. I, I the test my, my only problem in taking the test when someone interviewed me for English and they asked me to read a paragraph and I came across the word W-R-O-N-G and I said wrong. He said, you're not pronouncing that correctly. I wanted to be humble, and I said, please tell me how to pronounce it. He says, you got to carry the G. Would you say it? And I'll say it to you. <laughs> he said, wronger, wronger, wronger. Well, <laughs> I said, wronger. <laughs> I said, wronger for a while until someone said, well, where did you get this thing wrong? I said, wronger is the correct way of saying it. <laughs> Well, at any rate, I don't know anybody who said it wrong, and I stopped saying it. As far as the that's, people that were with him, that's the only problem I had. <laughs> I gave them information to someone on the fifth floor that had the names of the people who worked together with Mortimer River. Ritter. It was in a newspaper that I had from many years ago. He was the first president, but he was also the high school principal 
of the fashion high school of fashion industries because we all started it was there. Called something else, I think. Central Needle Trades. Then they changed it to Fashion Industries. Well, Baltimore really at the time worked with Mayor. Uh, what's Mayor's title? They should have the those names up there. Because I gave her the clipping, and I'll look home for it, because I gave her a copy of it. Who gave you the test? Who made up these tests that you said? The Board of Ed, a uh, Board of Examiners at the Board of Education at Livingston Street. It was a two-day exam, make a pattern, cut it, and sew it. I had to sew it. As a woman for pattern making, I had to be able to sew it, cut it, and have a finished garment in two days. And the men? Well, men maybe just for the grading and the other things, I don't know. But for me, I had to sew it up. Yes, my test, I had to sew. And when I took the first test, the solid material and you didn't talk to anyone, everything was really strict. You were so afraid you couldn't talk to anyone. Today, exams are, well, teaching at a college is different. They're starting at the high school. You had to go through this exam for two days. And then an oral test, that was another day. They would give you a book. You stood near the window, and they wanted to see how you're able to speak to people. But and that test wasn't required for the college, though, was it required? Well, we, that's how we got our license with the high school first. But then we were chosen. FIT. That's where they took the people, those that were teaching in the high school first. Uh, Ritter, this was Ritter. Ritter, was he was the one, yes, the head man. And then, of course, he had his chairmen, like Mr. Curtis. And Mr. Curtis got in touch with me to teach at FIT on the ninth floor. The eighth and ninth floor of the high school of fashion industries was FIT. And what was C Curtis's title? He was as chairman of the pattern making department, yes. And at the time, the course was for three credits was $10. Now for three credits is $200. <laughs> and the salary also, $750 an hour. Now it's $69 an hour. But yes, you ask. What was your, had you worked as pattern makers? Oh yes, I worked for over 38 years as a pattern maker and designer. But I stuck to pattern making because I found designers, they're good as their last style. If they don't sell, they're out of a job. But a pattern maker, you work for 53 weeks a year. I always had plenty of work, yes. Could you explain what a pattern maker does? Well, you could either make a pattern from a sketch or from a garment. And you could make it two ways. Either you drape it with material on the figure or you make a sloper. A sloper is a block pattern that'll fit that size 10 figure. And then we could plan any style, any neckline, it'll come out right. But it's knowing how to make that sloper. That's what we teach our students here. That's why this college is the best college. Not that because I'm here, but because we start them with slopers. They come from other colleges, they never made a sloper. It takes time, there's a lot of math involved. But I tell them, don't get too confused with the math. It's just making the sloper, because then making styles, you create your own style. And then you copy the pattern, and it's got to be made to fit. That's what I tell them, you know, you have to learn. It's not that you could go up with all your degrees to a job. They're going to give you a sketch, and if you don't know how to make that sketch, you're out of a job, even if you got all A's in college. Because some of them are very worried, the students, about getting A's. I tell them A is not important. It's important that you know how to make the pattern. Because that's what they cut the garments in industry. I mean, you go to Macy's, third floor, the racks are full. Those garments have to fit. Whether they're cheap dresses or expensive dresses, they got to fit. But now everything is specialization. When I started, you had two years of pattern making. You learned everything, undergarments, coats, suits. But it was like you went to a doctor years ago. The doctor took care of everything. Today, if your nose, you go to the nose doctor. The same with patterns. If you want to work on sportswear, that's where you, you go to a place sportswear. Dresses is dresses. A children's wear is something else. 
pattern makers today are specialized people in their particular field. It's like doctors are. A doctor doesn't take care of all your aches and pains, the same with the uh, pattern maker. And when did you come when? Well, I started here in 1964 as a student. Uh, my first semester I commuted three days a week from Pennsylvania. Uh, I was fortunate because I had my own airplane. So I used seriously? to, seriously, I used to land at Newark Airport and I had uh, Benjamin DeFazio for pattern making, I had uh, Chris Papillo for dresses, and I had Harry Greenberg for grading. And once I knew this is what I wanted, and I was doing a good job, and it wasn't the fact that I was just following my father and grandfather's footsteps, I told my father, I'm moving to New York, I'm going to go to FIT, on a regular basis. And Professor Greenberg said, well, if you're really serious, I get you a job. He sent me over to Junior Touch, who happened to be one of my father's competitors, which he didn't know at the time. And I went to work for Junior Touch as a grader and marker maker, finished my studies, and I had moved here to New York and stopped commuting. After I came out of the service and I was working for Leslie Fay for about five or six years, Professor Greenberg approached me and he wanted me to start teaching. Uh, at that time, my job wouldn't permit it, but afterwards, about two years later, I was working for Gay Gibson, which is another dress house. I was able to do it, and I've been teaching here 21 years. And for the last year, uh, I've been chairman of the department. Well, to be totally honest, I'm the ninth generation in this. Uh, so it goes back more than just my grandfather and my father. Uh, my father was head of production for Westover Fashions in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. I grew up in the factory along with all the other kids in the neighborhood because we all had jobs after school. There's no such thing as uh, go play ball. Uh, everybody had to do a little work and understand responsibility. It wasn't a question of uh, needing the money. It was a question of basically the way the parents thought the child should be trained. Hazleton was a strange community. <clears throat> it was 50% anthracite coal and 50% textile. Across the street from the factory was the old Duplin silk mill. And this was one of three of their plants in the immediate area, and it was the largest single silk mill in the entire world. In its heyday, they had a million and a half square feet in one building. It employed thousands of people. And everybody in the town either worked in coal or in textile. And uh, I grew up basically learning to inventory garments, uh, carrying bundles between operators, learning the flow of the sewing room, then gradually working in the cutting room, grading, marking. And all my father's employees used to use me as a fulcrum to teach. For the simple reason, my father said, no, you'll go and you'll do something better. I didn't want to do anything better. This is what made me happy. What's grading? Grading is taking one size and creating all the other sizes with a mathematical formula. And Professor Greenberg is probably one of the foremost authorities on grading. And during World War II, he had a special project where he showed the military how to grade some menswear that they were having an awful lot of difficulty with. I know over the years, from several other people, he has solved problems that other people couldn't in regards to foundations, lingerie, dresses, and what have you. And the man has never been wrong. I try to follow in his footsteps. When you say nine generations, what do you mean nine generations of work? Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm the ninth. My father was the eighth. My grandfather was the seventh. They all worked in textile production, clothing production? That's right. Uh, in the United States? No. Uh, my father's family came from Austria. 
So my grandfather came here shortly before the turn of the century. Uh, he was part of the ILGWU when they were first getting started. So was my grandmother. So we have a long history in the trade. Of course, most of the immigrants at that time were also very involved in the union, as well as being involved in the trade. It was a matter of survival. If they didn't band together and form the union, uh, this trade would not be anywhere near what it is today. I mean, you take a look at what the union has done for the worker. They've rallied around the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire and different other things to get fair working conditions. They were also part of establishing FIT. Well, very simple. If the union had fought it, rather than promoted it, FIT would have had a hard time. Because basically, some of the things that the students would learn, like in other departments, like the engineering department, if you're going to put in motion and time study and tell the operator now you're going to get paid by the piece, which 50 years ago was a rather novel idea, uh, that was almost sacrilegious. People just didn't accept that idea unless the union would sanction it. And a lot of things came to being only because it was proven to be good for everybody. And a lot of these innovations, which most people take for granted, actually came out of FIT. The, such as the... Uh... Such as the adoption of motion and time study. Uh, Which basically is what? Well, basically you turn around and you take a stopwatch and you watch the operator perform her duties. You figure out where she is uh, losing time doing uh, things she doesn't have to do. It gives the pattern maker, who also gets involved, a better idea of how to make the pattern better so that the operator can sew more efficiently without ruining the aesthetic beauty of the garment. It allows the operator to earn more money because she can produce the item faster and she's getting paid on piece rate. And the manufacturer is happier because their overhead is less even though everybody is getting paid more. So these are concepts that the average person would have a lot of difficulty uh, conveying if it wasn't for the fact that the college training new people were able to do this. Uh, many years ago, when you did grading, you did it by hand. Here in our department, we teach it three ways. They start with the old manual way, so they get their foundation. Then they go to the manual grading machine, which uh, for many, many years in the amalgamated was not allowed. And now, for the past 14 years, we're teaching it by computer. And we were the first to teach it by computer. And we teach pattern making by computer. And again, that was another innovation, along with a lot of other innovations that we've had in this department. In order to help the immigrant population who come into our field, we have been teaching our courses in foreign languages for many, many years, well over 30 years. Now we are teaching in Chinese, both Mandarin and Cantonese, Spanish, Korean, Greek, and we're starting Russian. So that gives today's worker who is in the industry an opportunity to learn, to elevate themselves, and to begin to assimilate. Because this way they can get their college degree, they can learn English, they can take their technical courses on a bilingual format, and then start to work on their advanced courses and their liberal arts, and they have an adjustment period where they can develop an understanding and a workable knowledge of English. Because otherwise, a lot of times, a lot of the employees turn to become isolated. You take people downtown uh, in Chinatown, Little Italy. If everybody around them speaks their native language, they never learn English. They don't have to learn English. And then if they go and want to do something else, they're held back because they're not capable of communicating. So it's a wonderful opportunity.
and this is just one of many programs we've had in our department. We had a VFI program which Professor Greenberg turned around and uh, handled. What is VFI? VFI was a special program between private industry council and FIT uh, and the Vocational Foundation to take people who dropped out of high school had minor scrapes with the law and to teach them sample cutting, grading, and marking and to put them to work and to make them a successful portion of the community. They were taught during the day. They came to school five days a week, four days here at FIT, one day at uh, VFI to learn English and math, and they worked five days a week in the industry. Now, in order to stay in the program, they had to maintain their jobs. We got them jobs. About 87% of these students not only maintained their jobs, but after they finished, they entered FIT to get a regular degree. Out of which, about 65% got their associate degree, and over half of those who got their associate degree came back and turned around and went for their bachelor's. Now, unfortunately, pattern making doesn't give a bachelor's yet, but they went and got their bachelor's in design or in textiles or one of the other areas. Hmm? But that upper division was very important. And a lot of them graduated, I would say, over 40 percent. So considering the fact these were high school dropouts, this is a tremendous opportunity and a tremendous success rate. It's all because of the way we work together. Now, when Professor Greenberg started this program many years ago, he went around to the people who he had taught years ago, and basically he's taught more people in the industry than anybody else I know, and everybody said, if this is what you want, we will make it work. And it wasn't just the fact that I was a pattern service at the time. He went to people like Russ Toggs and a lot of other people, and they put the Russ effort. Russ Toggs is a manufacturing It was a very large manufacturing firm. They paid half the amount, and the government put in the other. Right. True, the uh, wages of the student were subsidized, but the program was that uh, they had to perform and they, they had to work out, and these people did well, and most of them stayed in the industry. And the fact that you have people who would have normally right. spent more time in jail right. are now earning a living. And, and became good citizens with gainful employment that they could support themselves. And support themselves well. Good, well, yeah, no, that was a very good program. You started the program here? Yes. Well, I came from Poland. Came I came here when I was eight years old. We came to Kansas City where my father lived, and he never knew me because my mother was pregnant when he came to America. And uh, after two and a half years, he passed away. We came to New York where my mother had her brothers and sisters and mother. Her entire family was in New York. And it was a hard going all the time. I sold uh, shopping bags and matches and uh, every, anything I could do to make a couple of dollars, my greatest pleasure was to hand it to my mother. Well, at age 11 and a half, uh, I received uh, 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 contact with somebody who needed somebody there from 3 o'clock till 8 o'clock at night. And I went up there, I was four feet eight at the time, and they offered me $12 a week for what I'm supposed to do. My answer to that was, I don't want $12. So before I was able to finish what I had to say, he said, I'm sorry, we can't afford more than $12. I said, I want $6, but I want to learn, learn, learn. He picked me up and he kissed me. <laughs> At the end of the week, I still had the $12.
At any rate, I didn't work till 8 o'clock. I worked till 10 o'clock. I came in Saturday and I came in Sunday. And he didn't let me cut a piece of goods. All he let me do was cut paper. Inside of 12, inside of nine months out, I knew everything about grading, everything. And I had to sweep the floor and deliver garments and make out charges and everything else. But I learned everything that I should learn the hard way. Well, to make a long story short, I worked as a, uh, uh, as a marker, grader, cutter, and uh, I put in 50 years in the garment industry. Five, oh, 50 years in the garment industry. I, the, the last 35 years of my being in the garment industry, I was a production man. And uh, those 35 years was uh, worked very, very hard. And in order to be a production man, you gotta know everything, but everything from soup to nuts. Uh, it was a great experience, something I'll always be able to think back about. It was after 50 years that I decided to retire from the garment industry because I was off of this job training program uh, as Mr. Trapman said, and I worked on that for 19 cycles, that's 10 and a half years. Out of the 10 and a half years, I was never out a day or any time at all. As a matter of fact, I asked somebody to take my place because I had a cold, and he said, I don't want to get a heart attack. <laughs> uh, that's how that program was to deal with these kids. Well, Would they were know, getting- Was that in the high school you talked about? So ready in the college? There was the VFI. Oh, the VFI. Yeah, yeah. This was at the college right here. And we, I taught them right here at, in a room upstairs, May 640, and then they decided to put me in the 236 West 27th Street, which I've been occupying for the past uh, uh, nine years. Now, when you say you were in the industry for 50 years, you worked both in the industry and at FIT at the same that time? That is right. That is right. I was, I was teaching here at night and okay. working there yes. during the day. And you also taught at the union. And I also taught in the ILGWU at the union for 15 years. Is that most of the faculty did that work in the industry and well, worked, worked here at night? Yes. They uh, still I do. Taught, yes. Most of our faculty yes. are adjuncts in this department. We only have four full-timers, even though we fill over 2,500 student seats a semester. Everybody else basically works in the trade and teaches here on a part-time basis. So consequently, all the students are getting current information. Everybody has to keep up with what they're doing. There are very few in this department who are full-time retired and do not do anything in the trade. Even those who are basically retired, as they call it, they are still consulting two and three days a week. So almost every single person here still has their fingers in the field itself. Yes, like I worked for 38 years, but in the evening always taught. That's how I taught for 38 years when I start working. I start teaching here two nights a week. And on Saturdays, I would go and freelance another pattern. So I had three jobs for the longest time. I've been retired from industry, but every once in a while, I go and freelance a pattern, a couple of patterns, make their line. But I'd say in the past two years, I haven't done that, because how many things could I do? But I've kept up with industry. You know the different machinery that they use, uh, different fabrics the reactions, and that's very important for an instructor to know, because you have to teach your students. Because when I teach them to make a pattern, I also demonstrate how they have to put it together. You just don't make lines and where are they going to end? And uh, it's very helpful to the student. They're learning how to sew also, because some haven't had sewing. We give it to them in the second semester, which should be given at the first, but the second helps anyway because I've been showing them. If I have them for the first term, I show them how to sew. Because my first experience, I knew how to make patterns. I went to Pratt Institute for two years, from the age of 13 to 15. And after that, I sat at a machine for five years, operating dresses. 
In the meantime, I went to school at night to get my high school diploma, then my starting my college credits, because once I passed the exam with the Board of Ed, I needed 32 credits. So I got them. I didn't have to pay for them. Once I passed for the, the exam, I didn't pay for them. Then, as you go on, you have to take another 30 credits, and I had 60 credits. When I start to teach here, because I taught here full-time for 12 years, I needed a degree. So I still had to continue to get my degree. I'm missing about 10 credits for a master's, but I said, I'm giving that up. <laughs> I'm not taking it. But my experience as an operator for five years, and I always made patterns. I continued making patterns. Friends came over, they came with a picture, and I made patterns. I went to visit, I made patterns. And, uh, and then I start getting a pattern maker's job. I would freelance that job first. I wouldn't leave what I had. Then I was always very lucky in industry. I worked very hard, and many of the employer always liked my work. And if they were going out of business, they made sure they got me another job. So I was never out of work. If they was gave it common for them to go out of business? Some would. The time, Sheila Lynn, uh, Seal Chapman, uh, Claire McArdle, they all, they would go out and go under another name, Katja Sportswear, and uh, they would make sure I would have work, and I never was out of work. They gave you a vacation, they'd say, oh, I need you, and uh, they'd give you double pay, and I was anxious to make money, and, and I earned quite a lot of money that when I went in to teach daytime, I taught 15 years at the public school. I got half my salary, but I thought, well, now I should take it easy a little, but I have still had to continue to take more courses. Now I'm retired two years from FIT, but I still carry my five class load, and that's it. I've enjoyed every bit of it. Could you talk a little about your background, how you happened to go into pattern making? Oh, I just love to so sew. As a as six years old, I would sew for my doll with scraps. I just enjoyed sewing. So when I graduated elementary school at the age of 13, my parents decided, well, I go to Pratt Institute. I learned how to sew. It's good for a girl to know how to sew. And after two years there, that's where I learned my pattern making, grading, uh, draping. I knew all that at the age of 15, and since then I've always sewed my own clothes, and I couldn't get a job as a pattern maker, because they says, you, a pattern maker? We never heard of a pattern maker under 30 years of age. Here I was only 15. So at the time, the union was on strike. I would go all along 7th Avenue. The first time coming to the city, my mother and my young brother, we came to the city. 463, we started with that building on 34th Street. I take all the names of the dress companies. My mother with my brother would stay in the, on, in the lobby, and I'd go to all the floors, and if they needed a pattern maker, no. Up to 12.30, then we go home. The third day, I said I could go myself because I traveled in a train before. Well, I was only Where 15, Brooklyn. It was only a half hour ride, but who had taken the train alone at the age of 15? But the second day, I traveled in a different car. <laughs> And so my mother, she could see that I'm going out and everything. So I was alone that morning, and when I went into this job, it was at 527th Avenue, he says, oh, I can't use a pattern maker, but could you sew? I said, sure. And I sewed a garment for him. It was 1230, he says, you can go to lunch. Who knew to go to lunch? Oh, I says, no, I must go home because my mother would be worried for me. Little did I know, after two weeks working there, sewing their duplicates, I would sew the garment, press it. Twelve people from the union, who jumps over the fence? Stop, you scared. I didn't know what it was. See, what happened? But the sample maker Hello. was striking. And I was yes, uh, taking her job, but I didn't know that. So I'm, I'm crying. I'm only 15. A lady says, look. I'm old enough to be your mother. They start speaking to me in Italian. They figured, you know, and the man said, too, we're not going to take you anywhere. We're only going to take you two blocks to the union. So that's where I got into the union. And then they thought, well, I'm a pattern maker. I'm a designer. They tried to get me a job as a pattern making designer. But after three months, 
I told this Tessie and Mr. Longo, I said, you know, get me a job as an operator. I'll get myself a pattern maker's job as I get older. Sure enough, five years I worked as an operator, and I was about 19, I start freelancing patterns on my own. And then I went out on my own making patterns. And I've been making patterns ever since. Do you speak Italian? Are you from oh, Italian? yes, I speak Italian. That's why sometimes I feel discriminated. We have all nationalities. We don't have an Italian course. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, did you, are your parents born in Italy? As a matter of fact, I was born in Italy. I came here at nine months old. Yes, and my parents were born in Italy, yes. No, my father was native born. He was born here, and at the age of three, they went back to Italy. They don't like to live here in New York. That's how we came to America. My father was native born, he came, and a year later, my mother and I joined him. Now, most of the people in the industry, the apparel industry, were Italian and, and Eastern Jewish. European Jewish. Yes, they were. Years ago, yes. The factories would... spoke in the language of... Oh, yes. They would speak the language because all the foreigners would work. Whether it was Jewish people or Italian people, you wanted to work. It's not like today. They're not interested to go to work. No one. They just want things to come easy. Well, you have new immigrant groups. Here. That's it's, correct. It's now, been going into pattern making, you're saying. That's, that's why we teach... Unfortunately, not in Italian like Chris would like. <laughs> but Italian people don't go into it anymore. Well, they go they into do, different segments. Yeah. You I see, the industry has changed. A lot of people don't go into this portion. They go into the ownership. They go into sales. So you see them here at FIT, but you don't see them in this department like you used to. Uh, the more manual type of labor is basically being done like it always has with the immigrant group. It's been a, an avenue for hundreds of years for them to be able to enter into a field, make an excellent living. When I say an excellent living, we have pattern makers today who are making seventy-five, eighty-five thousand dollars a year. And considering if you only have an associate degree, that's not bad. There are not too many fields where you can do that. Plus the fact you're earning before you graduate, which is another plus. Uh, of the people who are here, are some you say go into management? The, uh, that is correct. People who are in the family businesses, they go into the management? Is that well, some are in the family business. Some decide they want to go in on their own. Uh, some start with the family business and then transfer over. You know, there's a certain amount of competition. Uh, a lot of people think the grass is greener. I know a lot of people whose family have been basically sewing contractors. They've turned around and they said, well, a pattern maker is better. A manufacturer is even better. And they start by working as a pattern maker. And they take some additional design courses and then they design a line for themselves and they go out on their uh, lunch hour or maybe even take a few months off and start to pedal a line and little by little, step by step, they become a manufacturer. Depends how much chutzpah you have, yes. which is an old Jewish word for understanding how much guts you have, how much determination, how much enterprise you have. Chutzpah. Yes, that, that was really a man's world, pattern making and production management, because when I started, hardly any women. When any trimming man would come up, I want to speak to the pattern maker. I am. He'd look at me. There was a PM club. One of the manufacturers yeah. said PM club was pattern maker's club. It was like a, a society. They would get jobs for you. So this lady says, i got to take you up there. But when she took me up there, and at those days, they were all men there. I said, you're bringing me to a place where there's all men? I can't belong to this place. And I never joined it. Now there's what a lot year? of women. What well, at the PN Club. What years was this? 19, oh, this 50, was uh, 19, I'd say, uh, 40, 1941, during the war. There was the L85 rules. You couldn't make a skirt any wider than 20 inches. L85 rules, yes that time and I says I wouldn't go up there there was all men there that wasn't for me although my job then as a pattern maker was always working with a lot of men 
I always worked with men because I had my table, but the cutters were there because if the grader had a grade, he'd call me over. How should we grade this? Everyone wants to know. The girl who sews wants to know, too. That's why I tell my students, you have to have a good knowledge in all the fields. Because if, say, to grade, you don't know how to grade, how could you tell anyone what to do? You don't know how to sew that. How could you tell them? Because they're going to ask you. They're going to come up to you. You're the t person there. T you get the top pay. No one wants responsibility. Because you can grade something different ways. You can leave the center panel the same, maybe, or give it a half and half, or give it one and two thirds, whatever. So, and that's what happens. So I never joined that pattern making club. You say so. Most of the people who come in now, do they they know how to sew, or they don't? Know? Mixed. I have students who do know, and I have students by the end of the semester, they have learned to sew. That's with the machine sitting there. With the machine, up. yes. Unfortunately, we don't have too many good machines. We have two machines. The needles are always broken. It's isn't it a shame? Well, but what could we do? It's like anything else. When it gets overused, it breaks, and this is the big problem. Uh, when I came to America, <laughs> uh, I came with a brother who was two years older than I. When it came to a point where he became 16, I said, Jack, why don't we go to a lawyer and straighten this thing out? Because I mixed up our passport. I was considered as being 16, and he was considered 14. So he said to me, look, you're the ambitious one. You go out and get your working papers. Oh. And so when I was 14 <laughs> years old, I got a job, and uh, they interviewed me, and he says to me, I never lie because my grandmother taught me don't lie because you were named after my father who was a big rabbi, and he says, always tell the truth. And it's been embedded into my mind all these years, and whenever something comes up, I always think of her. And But I couldn't find a job at the time, so I had a lie. They interviewed me. And uh, how old are you? 21. 21? Okay. This is a job for three days. Well, we started on Thursday. I put in Friday and I put in Saturday. We were 18 cutters at the table. Saturday night about 6 o'clock, we walk out and the two bosses and the production man say, you come in and you don't come in and you come in and you don't come in. Well, I don't know why, because, but I was on the last, the last one on the total pole to walk out. Oh, Mr. Greenberg, and they both, three of them shake hands with, don't forget, we'll see you Monday morning. <clears throat> to make a long story short, after I worked there between the ages of uh, 17 and 19, I grew seven inches. So my boss takes me on the side, he says, say, Harry, you're part of our family, you belong here. I wouldn't think of doing without you. Tell us the truth. How old are you? Because when you came here, you had to reach for the time card to punch your card. And I, <laughs> I said, well, this is the truth. And I told them I was 14 years old. And I told them why all this happened. And <laughs> he couldn't imagine how this was done. Well, I spent 11 years there. And then I had to find a defense job. And I came across this job at Cultural Why did you have Operation. to find a defense job? Why did you have to find a defense job? Because job? my draft, they had trouble with their uh, field jacket, which was a mostly white used uh, garment in the, in, in the, in, 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 in all over the world. They had trouble with the grading. And I take a look at Philadelphia Quartermaster's grading, and I see by my own teachings and everything else that this whole pattern is not graded right. So my boss came down one day, <coughs> and he said, and I said to him, look, if you give me three weeks, I'll regrade this pattern, sizes from 32 up to 52, and let me cut a dozen of each and show you that this is going to fit after I get through with it. He says, what do you know about menswear? You're a ladies' man, meaning that I was in the ladies' line all the time. 
And so I said, he said, he shakes hands with me, he said, you got yourself a deal. And after three weeks, I had a man, you give me a hand at the time, and to cut that paper was like leather, it's not like what we use. And so we made a dozen garments, and they were made up, and everybody wanted to know who Harry Greenberg was, and they came to see me. And so after about six weeks, my boss came down to me, and he was in the office two blocks away, and we had a, used to be a former skating rink, into a cutting room, and I was in charge of 32 cutters there. And he said to me, Harry, on account of you, I didn't sleep last night. I said, what's the matter? Maybe on account of you, I didn't sleep, because I was waiting for him to come and show me appreciation. He says, the position you hold at this time, your salary is frozen. I'm going to make you uh, vice president in charge of production, and, that, and then I'll be able to give you a $50 raise. In those days, a $50 raise, a lot of people didn't earn that kind of money. Well, I says, thanks very much. And after about three weeks, I don't see the money. So they tell me who to go up to see. There was a girl by the name of Sylvia Fisherman. And I went up there and she started to holler at me. She said, I don't make that all weekend. You want a $50 raise? I said, look, honey, don't holler at me. Just call Dick Davis over and ask him, but don't holler at me. You got a big mouth. And so she called Dick Davis over. And he says, yes, I forgot to tell you how he gets a $50 raise and pay him for all his overtime. It was unheard of at the time to give somebody a $50 raise. But there was the Army, and that's the way they worked. And when you say it was the Army, this was owned by the Army, or is it a contractor who worked for the Army? He was a contractor okay. that did work for the Army and Navy at the time. We were out in Long Island City. Well, this girl, Sylvia, that I had a fight with, uh, called me up one day about a couple of days later, she said, Harry, I understand you live in Borough Park, which is about three blocks away from me. Borough said, Park in Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> I said, yes. She said, would you mind if I go home with you? I said, come down and I'll be glad to take you home. Well, at any rate, would you want to pick me up the next day? I said, yes. So I picked her up. Well, to make a long story short, we had lunches and everything else. And then I came home at night. I was tired. She invited me up the house. and. We got the family after a couple of years, P.S., we got married. <laughs> uh, we married uh, 47 years, and I want you to know that when I met her, she hollered at me. <laughs> she still hollers at me. <laughs> but if one of us is to go, I'd like to be the one to go first because I don't know what I would do without her. Harry? Isn't the uh, field jacket that you worked on for the military sure. how how uh, Mortimer Ritter came to know you? Oh, Mortimer Ritter came to know me through a write-up in the trade paper. I don't know which paper it was, where uh, Mortimer Ritter one day calls me, and I'm standing near Dick Davis's desk, which is uh, who was my boss. And he uh, was a big contributor to, uh, to the high school of fashion industries. And he says, you have a Harry Greenberg working for you? He says, yes, yeah, sure. He says, what do you think of him as an instructor in my, my school? Well, the, the type of humor my boss had, he says, I think he'd stink. So he says, if that's the case, I want to put him on the phone. I get on the phone, he says, Harry, I'd like to see you in my office tomorrow at 2 o'clock. I says, wait till I see if I can get time up. My boss says, go, go, go. And that's when this all started. That was Ritter. Ritter, Mortimer Ritter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was the first to, to get this started. He was the first this president. This was one of the early departments in the college, I think, wasn't it? Not really. Fashion design was always first, yes. We were second. Right. It was right. fashion design, textiles, and then panel making. Came. But we weren't recognized as a daytime class until uh, 20 years ago, when we have daytime classes. Well, that's how. That's to how get a degree, they had to come at night. Well, that, that's how I got started. 
but I want to tell you something. I put in 50 years in the garment industries, 5 -0. I never collected unemployment insurance. No, I was never true. out of a job. As a matter of fact, I gave out jobs. Yes. Do you come from a background of, uh, was your family, parents? I had two uncles who were operators. Operators, Machine sewers. Machine operators, sewing. And one in lived Poland, on, this is, in Poland? Yes. And one lived on Simpson Street, and I thought it was a great neighborhood at the time, and, I, and the other one lived about three it's blocks Brooklyn. away from there. Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Uh, that's in the Bronx. Oh, Bronx, that's Simpson that's Street. The yeah. South, South Bronx. <laughs> but anyway, I used oh, to emulate. Days. I used to emulate them. They made such a beautiful living with children and everything else, and that's what caused me to believe in the garment industry so much. But I surpassed them. They, <laughs> they did, saw me. Did they do this in Europe? Did they were they sewers in Europe? Yes, in Europe they called them Schneiders. <laughs> Tailors, they were tailors. Tailors, yeah. yeah that's and over had. here, uh, they were operators. And they made a wonderful living for so the you mentioned family. a rabbi in your family. That's uh, Was he also a tailor and a rabbi? When you said there was a rabbi in your family, was he also, they were also tailors? No, no, no. The rabbi was my mother, my grandmother's father. And he used to say to her, he was a great rabbi in Poland. And he used to say, always tell the truth. And that's how I grew up telling the truth. Coming back, the only lie I really had to make was with my age oh, at yeah. the time. We all did that. <laughs> was your mother also in the garment industry? No. She was a sick woman, and she went out to make a living. We never had anything like a handout from anybody. Anything we earned was, anything we had was hard earned money. And uh, when we came here from uh, Kansas City, we moved in with my grandmother in three rooms, and uh, we were two families in that apartment. But in Poland, I lived on a dirt floor. Uh, our toilets were outside. If we needed water, we had to go out to the well. And we had a kerosene lamp. And there was my bringing up, and uh, it was hard. It was hard going, and many times I tell some of these stories to my students, only to explain to them that I'm a human being, and just like they are, they, some of them come uh, from hard knocks. And They're I also am, the immigrants themselves. Yes. As you know. And I am very, very proud, very proud at this stage of the game to interview be interviewed for the 50th year at FIT. I am proud that I was able, that I'm able to be around to see this. And I used to tell this to Marvin Feldman, and now it's uh, Alan Hirschfield, who's a great guy, and Marvin Feldman put in about 22 years here. And I'm really happy to be around, and some people ask me, Harry, you're here so long, how old are you? Well, the answer to that is, I've reached a stage where when I go all out, I wind up all in. So uh, I could go on and on and elaborate about all this, and uh, uh, I'm so proud of my background and the fact that I never needed anything because a mechanic will always make a living. When Chris Pupilo was talking about the PMT Guild, I was also proud at the time they picked me the Man of the Year. There was a 1987 Right, the there was a nice dinner and dance. Uh, yes. Which uh, Chris Pupilo attended and Mr. Lenny Trapner attended. We had about 250 people there and celebrating. And uh, I had great days. If you come into my office, I have about 60 plaques all over. I count the 60 I, It points. is wonderful to hear the, the story of this department. Could you talk a little about the students, their changes, I mean, what you've noticed, since you said they worked full-time before and used to go at night? And well, they still do. Uh, very simple. We fill about 500 seats during the day school, which translates somewhere in the neighborhood of about 
oh, 200 daytime students, maybe a little less. In continuing ed, we're looking at somewhere between 2,200 and 2,500 student seats, which means, considering the fact that they work during the day and they are taking one, two, maximum three, three classes, we are serving somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1,500 students, which is a big difference. These are people who are coming up through the trade. Some of them are bundle boys or spreaders. They are the people who take the cut work from the factory and tie it up before it goes to the operator. It goes from the cutting room to the sewing operator. If they learn to tie up the, uh, the cut parts, and if they're good, they learn to spread the cloth. From spreading you know, the laying out of the actual cloth so that we can cut it in bulk to make garments. And when we cut, we're not talking cutting 20 or 30 garments, we're talking maybe 500 to two or three thousand at a clip. When they get good at that, they learn to cut, which means taking a cutting machine and slicing it through thousands of dollars worth of goods, which will then be bundled by the bundle boy, which they used to do for years, years ago, and now turn around and go through the uh, sewing operation. Most of these people know, in order to really get ahead, they have to become either a marker maker, or a grader, or a pattern maker. What's a grader? A grader is a person who takes the single size and makes all the other sizes. Marker maker takes the graded pattern and lays it out so it can be cut efficiently for production. And they know one thing. Years ago, this was learned on the job. When you learn on the job, number one, you can only learn what the person who's teaching you knows. Number two, you can only learn exactly what he is willing to teach you. And number three, you can only learn what happens to come up at that time, because if it doesn't come up, there's no opportunity for you to learn it. So consequently, they know to turn around and come here to FIT. They know they can earn a living. They know, thanks to Professor Greenberg and a lot of other people, as they go through their education here, they turn around and can elevate themselves in the industry, earn more money, before they become a pattern maker. So as they are going through a three to five, maybe six year training program here in continuing ed, they are constantly elevating themselves. And this has been the history of this department. Everybody knows shortly after you start, you're going to make more money. So consequently, the schooling is basically paid for itself, and this is a major attraction. And do they need a, re a degree to do this work? Do they, uh, By and large, most of the people do have a degree. There are some who don't. Okay, and again, you have many people who learn on the job. You have many people who profess to have a degree who really don't. Now, those who've taken all their basic technical courses and haven't taken their liberal arts, which to some students is quite a challenge because they're afraid of failing because they have to do it in English, which is one of the things that they don't realize because here at the college there are so many programs to help them. Uh, English is a second language, tutoring uh, facilities and everything else, which the pattern making department plays a big role in because we make sure the students are aware of what is available to them. We help them. Uh, we introduce them. Sometimes we even lead them by the hand so that this way they will know. They work in these shops, these manufacturing places. That they're working in like a Chinese setting, Cantonese, or, and Dominican. That is correct. What, what's the Latino groups that are here? Well, you have uh, Hispanic people from Mexico, from Puerto Rico, uh, from the Dominican. Uh, you have some from uh, Central and uh, South America as well. Uh, we have uh, a lot of Haitians right now, and some people have been asking if we're going to turn around and teach in French. Uh, we have uh, people who come from overseas. 
We get a lot of students who come in from Thailand, uh, from the Philippines, uh, also from South Africa, who are willing and able to elevate themselves. Their concept is they're not going to stay here. They're going to come here, they're going to learn, and they're going to go home. And most of these people are only interested in the technical courses. They don't care whether they get a degree or not. If they can, it's wonderful. Many of them come here, they already have a first degree. They're just coming here to get uh, the meat and potatoes so they can go back and go into the family business and turn around and do what they have to do. I happen to uh, have a picture of Lenny Trapner and his wife. This is when he got married 17 years ago. And uh, I was a witness to the wedding. And My wife still talks still, to him. They both still <laughs> talk to him. You want to show the picture on camera? That's right. <laughs> Harry, right. turn the turn picture, picture around. Turn the picture around. My reason for taking it out is twofold. I'll have it in my wallet. Grading <coughs> is like you take a picture like this <coughs> and you want to make a 14 by 20, <coughs> excuse me, and you want to hang it on the wall. What happens? Everything gets larger in proportion. The eyes, the ears, the nose, the hair, the head gets larger in proportion. That is grading be larger in proportion, to not to distort it. And this is the picture of Lenny Trapman and his wife 17 years ago. And I had a sign of papers with the rabbi that I'm a witness that they got married. But that is my interpretation of the grading. That was my reason for taking it out. As I said before, I am proud not only to be in many ways that I could talk for days about my background and everything else and, and things that happen in the windows in the garment industries. And I'm happy to be here sitting along Mr. Trapner, who was a student of mine when he was 19 years old and proud to have given him his first job and doubly proud to see him in the chair of being the chairman of the pattern making technology department. And now he's my boss. <laughs> That's right. Could, could you talk a little about the changes in the industry that you've seen? You know, uh, uh, because there's talk about the industry declining. And building. Well, the well, when we when I came here, we had the Italians and the Jewish people, and uh, now it's entirely different. We have the League of Nations. Okay. Talk Your teaching me. has to be different. You have to apply yourself to some of those people who can't speak English. And so it's it's a little tougher, but you have to do what you have to do in a time like these. Thank you. You know, you yes. have to leave. Is there something yes. you'd like to be part of the archives? Because well, before what you would go you, class, yeah. Well, ask me, what did you like? Well, the changes Maybe you as see a, the in the industry and what are the students like? Do you know? Well, I find students are not as knowledgeable as they were years ago. They don't know anything today. In terms of sewing? Sewing, they don't. You see, when I start making patterns, I would make my pattern, hmm. I would cut it, I would have to sew it, and I would have to grade it. Because the boss would say, I need that in a hurry. But after you, they know what you could do, you've established a name for yourself. Oh, Christine? Oh, she's a good worker. He'd say, I need this pattern graded for tomorrow. I say, wait a while. Harry happened to be the grader at the time there. He's a good friend of mine. You want me to take his overtime away? Then you could be independent. <coughs> oh, I'd say, no, I want to be friends with him. You give him overtime and let him work. But that you could talk after a few years. But my beginning jobs, I did everything because I wanted to keep the job. Students today, don't have any knowledge of sewing. They're probably a telephone operator and they want to learn to make patterns. And it's a little more difficult. I find that you have to spend more time with them. And at times, uh, we make 15 projects. Maybe you could only finish 14 good with them because they don't have that background. They don't have parents at home that could show them 
parents know nothing about it. Is it true of the new immigrant groups too? No, I'd say immigrant groups, at least they know sewing. They know they're the, sewing. The American students. You know. It's the American students, yes. Some of them just feel, well, there's good money in it, and I tell them, there is good money, but you have to know. You just don't get a job and make money. Pattern maker, you're the top person in the place. You're not going to just make money. I find there's a difference in the students, yes. It's not the language. They speak the language. It's just that they don't have that background. As little children, they don't know how to make a hem. They don't know how to sew a button. Whereas I knew how to make a hem, sew, backstitch. We did sewing in the house. American students are from the New York area, the New York City area? Well, oh, they come from all over. But they're from Europe. Some come from Japan and China. We but have the American them. students you have. The American students, yes, they know nothing because they've never even sewed a button on. They come in just, they're not even working in industry, some of them, but they want to learn. So it'll take the them a little longer. Well, some come from the high school and some don't. Uh, I would say about 20% of our day school students are definitely American from this area. But the rest are, and I would say, 80% of our day school students are American, but they're from other regions. And depending on the area of the United States that they come from, will give us a general idea of their background. Those who come from rural communities rather than urban communities know more because their families have required them to learn more about life in general. The ones that come from the urban communities basically have led what I would call a sheltered life. Uh, their families, in many respects, have turned around and said, you don't have to learn this. When you grow up and you go out, you will be able to procure this. You could buy this. You don't have to do it on your own. And consequently, part of their education, which you and I would consider basic, is now amiss because they are never exposed to it. You like the sewing? And the like the sewing. Or, as we find out with some of the dorm students, they've never made a bed before. <laughs> okay? <laughs> there were certain things they never had to. Uh, you see, years ago, a girl or a man, if they got a bundle of work, they had to make it up themselves. They had to know every stitch in that garment. Today, the work is divided, section work. One sews the side, the other sews the sleeve in. This one sews this, this one sews this part. It's all section work. So today they don't have to know that much as what they used to know, uh, like many years ago. I, I'm also proud to say that seven-eighths of the people who are teaching today in the pattern making technology department are former students of mine. And uh, when I go around, even, even not only in the pattern making department, in the upper divisions and all over the school. But, uh, yes, I could say the same. Half yes. of the, f yes, they're all my students too. If they yes. had him, they had me. Uh, uh, is it mostly females, uh, or, or was it always mostly females? In now it's making? getting more mostly females, but years ago it was mostly male. Here at FIT? Yes, FIT too. I have a class, they're all, there's two boys, and 25 girls in all my classes. Reversed. Two. But it, it used to be the other way around. It, it used to be, yes. Reversed. Or half and half, at least. Why but is that? Well, to a large degree, years ago, it was very hard for a woman to break into the trade. If she was an operator, that was fine. But certain jobs were basically reserved for men. That's right. Partly because they figured it required a man's physical force, such as a cutter or a spreader, graders and markers, the work was rather hard. And some people thought pattern making was just too technical for a woman. Of course, we know that's not so. Then, once the women finally made inroads, uh, there was a division of pay. And because the average woman earned less, they became more attractive to the manufacturer or employer for the simple reason. It cost less. So there was a change. Then a lot of people got the concept, well, 
uh, I don't stand a chance. So they don't even enter into the program. And that is a big mistake because there are a lot of people out there who could be doing pattern making or in one form or another. And today, pattern maker is not just a pattern maker. We have a whole different lines of work that didn't exist before. We have the computerized pattern maker. We have the spec technician. Uh, well, the spec technician is a person who takes the designer's sketch and is going to apply his knowledge or her knowledge of pattern making, give dimensions to the different seams and what have you, and this information is going to be sent to the actual pattern maker who is probably in another country. It will probably be faxed over to the Orient or over to Europe. Now, this person has to be very good because he has to understand the aesthetic beauty of the garment. If he looks at a sketch, he has to know how long the point of the collar is, taking a look at the sketch, how wide this spread should be, and everything else. So this person has to really be able to understand the designer's mind that what is a rendition, what is drawn for effect, and what this designer really wants, and translate this to a person who is thousands of miles away who is going to make a pattern. And it has to be a person who is very technically knowledgeable because whatever they direct has to be correct because the person around the world on the other side of the globe is going to say, hey, if this person doesn't know, why should I listen to them? The pattern and a sample garment will be made overseas. It will come back here to be critiqued by the spec technician. And the spec technician may also have to incorporate not only the designer's concept, but may also have to incorporate the requirements of a specific store like Spiegel's or J.C. Penney who have their own measurements. And they will require all this information to be coupled in with everything else, plus the concept of what could be done as far as the grading and the marking. So it is a whole different form of pattern making. In many cases, the pattern maker today is also partly a production person because in a lot of small firms, they no longer hire a production manager. They hire a merchandise manager to promote, but instead of having the production person that they used to have, the job falls on the pattern maker, and the pattern maker now has to work with the sales department and a lot of other people to turn around and make out cutting tickets and spec sheets and everything else that used to be reserved to a whole different group of people. Now, the industry basically has changed because the big firms have gotten to be much, much larger. And as they grew in size, they became very specialized as far as the details and the job descriptions for each person. On the other hand, there are a lot of smaller firms, especially the startup firms, and they are very small. And since it is very competitive and very difficult in this trade, and the economy is difficult in general, so that doesn't make it any easier, the person working there is going to wear many hats. So the pattern maker has to know a lot more than they did before because of the nature of the business. Today, the pattern maker also has to know a lot more for the simple reason the product is entirely different. We have synthetics that we didn't have 25 years ago. We have different processes. You have your no-wrinkle cotton and a lot of other things. And if you don't understand how to work with these finishes, and if you don't keep up with the technical advances, you're nowhere. So there is a continuous learning process that we didn't have before. Well, my father was a pattern maker back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. If a new product came along, it was a rarity. It was so novel, everybody knew about it. You experimented with it, and you learned to deal with it. Today, every time you turn around, there is something new. So pattern makers' knowledge is much greater today. Their learning is much more extensive. And this is one of the reasons why we are starting to plan for a bachelor's or upper division for pattern making because 
the student today needs more than what he ever needed before. And we also find that the students are willing to go. We did a survey. And what was thought impossible years ago created such a demand that they have been asking us, well, when is it going to be? We only asked them last semester, would you like a bachelor's program? Every week I get students, so when's it going to start? Okay. It means, very simple, FIT is growing again. Now, when I came here in 1964, FIT was only the C building. Today, we have a lot more buildings, and we don't have enough. We're teaching seven days a week. We were the first department to teach on Saturday. We were the first department to teach Friday night. And we were the first department to teach Sunday. And if you take a look at the wall and you see my use of classroom space, we have full utilization. Our classrooms are never empty from morning till evening. Scholarship for hmm? the scholarship for Oh, that's true too. We have two scholarships here. One, the Irving Curtis Scholarship Fund, which was named after the original chairperson. And last year, uh, the former chairman, uh, Harry Besserman, who was the original chairman who hired me, uh, started the Harry Greenberg Scholarship Fund. So now we fund two separate scholarships for our students. For full-time study, is that uh, Not only for full-time. The Harry Greenberg Scholarship Fund is basically for the continuing ed students. Uh, the Curtis, we have one for full-time and one for the uh, continuing ed students. So there are f four scholarships awarded every year that are funded by the department, plus an additional scholarship funded by Symphony Fabrics. And that's $1,000 a year. Do the manufacturers send their students here too? To Quite often. Oh, sure. Uh, we get calls every day, especially the manufacturer who hired somebody new do me a favor. I know classes have already started. I got a new uh, employee. Can you squeeze them in? All right. To give you an idea, our class size is supposed to be 25. Our average class is running 29 students. Okay. So we are overfilled both day and evening. And I see groups of students who know each other seem to come, like I guess friendship groups, people in the neighborhood. That is true. Well, they get friendly in class, but I don't know if they come together. Maybe they do. The Chinese people maybe do. But other the Spanish do too, and the Greeks, yeah. Yeah. because basically almost all the Greek students know each other from before. Oh. Uh, a lot of the Spanish students basically uh, have worked in the trade, and they one brings the other. Yeah, especially when they start in the in the Greek class or the Spanish class. Yes. You have a class in Greek too. You have Greek students. Mm-hmm. These are here to go back to Greece or no? Most oh, of them. most of these people who are Greek are probably going to go into the fur trade. Okay, and they will take our basic uh, pattern making classes in Greek. Then they will take the advanced classes in English and then they will probably take the specialization in leather and there is a good possibility we're going to go back to teaching fur. Are these, all these students have high school diplomas they come here? No, not all of them. A lot of them don't. And they know once they come here that they can get their GED through FIT. Yeah. After they have 24 that? credits, they could apply for the GED, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. What they have to do is they have to take 12 credits in their major, six credits of English, and six other credits of liberal arts. They must pass English literature and English composition. Without that, they can't get their GED. Then they were given an exam, and if they pass, they get their high school equivalency diploma. And this credit is used basically towards their college degree as well. So it's like killing two birds with one stone. Yeah. 
Is that because they didn't have a high school diploma from the country they come from? Is that it? That is correct. Okay, and they haven't entered into the New York City school system. They're older or something. Well, a lot of them can't, and uh, we have a lot of adult learners. And as a matter of fact, when you talk about adult learners, we have a lot of people who are coming back to learn who are older than I. So we get a lot of senior citizens who are interested in learning pattern making. Uh, some are still looking to work, and some are looking basically to learn for for their own uh, purposes. They want to make their own clothes and uh, they need the additional knowledge. And oddly enough, most of them want a degree. Hey, they're not the type that just stop uh, with... There's a new department, Greg. It is a wonderful department. Yes. I tell them to. It's a bread and butter course. Always make it, Right, that's a bread we're, we're, we're really all proud to be part of it. Right? <laughs> that's why when we're gone, we'd like to see the younger people that are going to carry on the good work. Do you see younger people coming into the, in your program? Oh, yes. You well, see. we do see a lot of younger people. We do have uh, faculty, uh, faculty yes. as well, yes. Uh, currently, we're training five new faculty members. Okay. Uh, the average faculty member that we bring in has at least uh, seven to ten years of trade experience plus their degree so that is a whole different ball game and these people are the type of people who are going to turn around and take this industry one step further because you know they came in teaching with more knowledge than the previous group of faculty members. And most of them basically have degrees not only in pattern making, but textiles or apparel production management as well. So they're coming in with two different viewpoints and translating both of these viewpoints to the new students. And these are mostly FIT graduates themselves, is that what That's I mean? correct. The vast majority of our department are all FIT graduates. Only I went to Pratt Institute. Well, when you went to Pratt, yeah, well, FIT didn't ago. exist. That's right. Absolutely. How could you go? You're That's right. Here yes. the early uh, is there something else you'd like to talk about? I know we're winding down about the uh, well, instance, changes what? in FIT, any changes, you've, other changes you've seen, or things you'd like to put on the record about the department? Well, the one change I would like to make mention of is we find that today's student is more aggressive. They will not sit still. They have a thirst for learning that uh, is probably much greater than what we had years ago. It's a little difficult for the simple reason some of them don't have the working background that the previous students had. So the job of educating them is more challenging. And that keeps our department young, regardless of the age of the faculty. And He's not looking too far. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not looking too far. But it's a very funny thing. Uh, our students do not have a problem. Basically, they relate to the younger faculty just as well as they relate to the older faculty, because they know they can pick their brains, and they do it regularly. Uh, most of our students, oddly enough, come in early in the morning. We have open lab for them at night from 10 o'clock at night till 2 o'clock in the morning. And I have a problem. The problem being is I have so many students who want to use the classroom as lab time, I can't fit them all in. And I have to be basically referee to a certain degree because they're all willing to stay here till 2 o'clock in the morning. Now, you don't find many students like that, and it doesn't matter whether they're taking our basic pattern making courses, whether they're taking the grading courses, the computer courses, and they wait patiently in line. I've seen students who came here the day after Thanksgiving when everybody else is going to party and enjoy the, the long weekend, and they're putting in 12, 14 hours into the lab because that's the only way they feel they're going to get enough time practicing and working so when they go out they can do what they have to do. 
So our students are very determined and dedicated in an entirely different fashion than they used to be before. But they've learned to accept our motto. Only positive thoughts and attitudes are tolerated here. Okay? And nothing is going to happen unless we make it happen. And they've learned it. They see it. They see it in their work, and they see it in their wallet. You stole a lot of my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, doesn't the student? He's been hanging around you long enough, so. And summing yeah. this up, all I can say.